Hey there, guys. Just a short, not-so-subtle pre-show reminder from your humble host that you're listening to the free first hour of this here THC episode, and we do reserve the second hour of each episode for Plus members, though I don't usually waste your time with ads or plugs. But if you're curious enough to hear more, you can now get a free seven-day trial membership by filling out the short form at the bottom of the page on the HiresideChats.com. So treat yourself. And maybe, fingers crossed, you'll stick around. If it works for Netflix, it should work for me, right? Now let's get this ride moving. The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan. This clearly may be something there beyond the realm of man. And until you thoroughly tested every last post just a few, I find the more you think you know, the less you really do. That's true, Dr. Zayas. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show, Greg Carwood Company. All right, higher side chatters, we know all too well that there is plenty of power hidden behind the veil. And unfortunately for us, the Earth has a rich history of control by vast interlocking networks of think tanks, multinational corporations, secret societies, esoteric orders, and hidden financiers, all aimed at crafting society to their will and molding modern man as they see fit. And while the conspiratorial baton has changed hands many times throughout history when it comes to the world stage today, it's the post-World War II Nazi fascist international that our returning guest Joseph Farrell has been tracking over the course of several years, and their fingerprints seem to be on much more than you might think. Today we're going to focus on the content of his latest two books, Rotten to the Common Core, Public Schooling, Standardized Tests, and the Surveillance State, And also, Hidden Finance, Rogue Networks, and Secret Sorcery, The Fascist International, 9-11, and Penetrated Operations. Both being further examples of amazing titles and examinations of where we see the game plan of this capstone cabal and the events and initiatives that reek of their underlying agendas. One of my favorite guests and yours, the man who dissects the plan, Joseph P. Farrell. Welcome back to the higher side. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, honor and a pleasure, my good man. You really are one of the greats. I'm really excited for this. And when I saw that Rotten to the Common Core was coming out, I was pumped because the education and schooling slice of the conspiracy pie is one that I think needs more attention because it affects us all so deeply. I mean, how could it not? Here, here. You know, we're forced to spend over a decade of our formative years under their nefarious guidance, and <laughs> it slow, slowly strips us down to nothing more but cogs in the machine, and it leaves people unfulfilled often for their entire lifetime. But even though compulsory schooling was sort of weaponized from the ground up, they definitely seem to be tightening the screws, so to speak, with this new Common Core curriculum, don't they? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, the the title says it all. My co-author and I have both been involved in education in our lives. He still is. I was fortunate enough to get out, although at the time I didn't think I was too (laughs) fortunate. But, you know, I, I saw the worst of the worst. And to me, doing the book was kind of... It was kind of a bit of karma for me being able to expose some of the things that I saw going on as a professor. One of my favorite anecdotes about the whole education methodology as it's taught in American quackademia, and that's (laughs) that's how I refer to it, is just shot through with psychological assumptions, philosophical assumptions. But my favorite anecdote from my teaching days was the fact I used to teach a variety of college-level history courses in modern European history, Russian history. Even at one point, I had to substitute for another professor who was on leave for a semester, so I took his diplomatic history of the United States course. And, you know, I, I had a wide range of courses that I taught. But in teaching modern European history, I used to give essay exams for the most part because I'm adamantly against the idea of a standardized test being able to capture anyone's process of reasoning. Hmm. So in the in the examination, the first question I put in the examination was list five things that the Treaty of Versailles stipulated with regard to Germany. You know, easy question. Mm-hmm. You can write out your five answers. 
And in the question, obviously, I had to spell Versailles, V-E-R-S-A-I-L-L-E-S. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. And the student answered, and incidentally, the student was an education major, all right? And this just goes to show, as far as I'm concerned, how colossally stupefying and stupidizing the American educational system really is, because this student responded by spelling Versailles, V-E-R-S-I-G-H. Huh. <laughs> Vers- Versailles, okay? When it's spelled correctly in the question itself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, there's there's such a disconnect here that, that, that this whole methodology is made that people aren't even capable of thinking anymore. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's that's kind of my anecdote to get us started. <laughs> Fair enough. And that really does go hand in hand with what I had as a first question for you, which is early on in the book, you do say that our focus is not so much upon the content or the standards themselves, but rather upon the assessment process and its implicit consequences for parents, students, and the teaching profession. Right. Can you elaborate on that assessment process, why it's so concerning, and what it does exactly? All right. Well, the problem with most of the debate, as far as my co-author and I were concerned with Common Core, is that everybody's focused on the standards themselves. Well, to us, this was kind of a clever distraction, because no one to my mind, that is involved in education would question the idea that there is a certain central core or body of knowledge that education is designed to hand down, whatever the subject matter you might be teaching, be it history or physics or mathematics or music or whatever. There is some sort of core that everybody acknowledges is there, although individuals might draw up a different list as to what that core might be, but there's substantial agreement. The real problem for us with Common Core is not in the actual idea that there should be some sort of common standard of disciplinary content that gets transmitted, but rather the idea that you can assess that core solely on the basis of standardized tests. Because what Common Core does is it takes the standardized test philosophy, the ACT, the SAT, Iowa Test of Basic Skills, that we all grew up having to fill out our little ovos, making sure to stay inside the lines Mm -hmm. with our number two lead pencils, and so on and so forth, is the idea that these tests can test reasoning process at all. They can't. What they're doing is they're providing you with a pre-selected list of answers that you have to choose from, These answers oftentimes punish the student that is much more aware of the subtleties of certain things than the test makers themselves. Hmm. So that's the first problem. But the second problem is that Common Core's assessment process supposedly takes the standardized test to a new level by making the test questions individually adaptive and responsive to the way the student answers the previous question, all right? So in other words, we're looking at the standardized test on steroids because like all such things, these are proprietary property. You cannot go in and look at the algorithms, the people involved in setting up these tests and so on and so forth. So again, you as a test taker are put into an even more insidious box of having to read the mind of the test preparers Mm -hmm. and to guess their answers. My classic example of what the standardized test, the problem of the standardized test, is, first of all, it's designed to reinforce an official narrative. Let me give you an example. You might encounter on a standardized test who assassinated President John F. Kennedy. Well, the answer is Lee Harvey Oswald, right? Mm Mm-hmm. But will those tests ever give you the option of selecting from, say, an answer that would say a conspiracy involving a coalescence of interests involving, you know, anti-Castro Cubans, disenfranchised elements of the American intelligence community or what have you? Because once you get into that kind of question, then you're required to not only know of that research, but be able to argue the case. Well, these tests do not allow you to argue your process of reasoning for anything. Mm -hmm. They simply make you a passive 
regurgitator of answers that they have pre-selected and that you simply select as the proper response. Right. And they would argue that this is all scientific. Well, we go into a lot of detail about some of these test questions that have appeared on previous tests, and they're anything but. You know, you might be able to come up with a correct answer in, in a mathematics question, but again, part of deriving that answer is to show how you derive it. I mean, that's part of the mathematical process itself. It's part of mathematical proofs. So it's not simply selecting an answer. It's showing how you reason to that answer. And none of these tests do that. So the Common Core puts this all on steroids by making it individually adaptable. Your response is individually adaptable to the individual student. You know, so this, this to me is the indicator that it is a huge data mining operation, <laughs> number one. And number two, what the standardized test, particularly in this instance where it's individually adaptive, what this means is that the test itself becomes kind of a loyalty test. Do you accept the standard narrative? Are you capable of knowing it and regurgitating it or do you not? So, you know, there's any number of ways to look at this, but the bottom line is for us, it's just a massive expansion of the surveillance state and it's handing over in the guise of education to these testing corporations, mountains of data, which, again, are proprietary to them. They can, in turn, use that data, sell it, and so on and so forth. So as far as we're concerned, it's a huge, huge scam. <laughs> I'm right there with you. Cheers to that. And uh, I, I love the old George Carlin line that they just want obedient workers. And I think that's yeah. the best term for what they're trying to churn out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I got some friends, I think a lot of people do, who might be in the teaching profession. And I thought about, as I was going through this book, how would they respond to you know, some of these things? And really the question that I think they don't ask that you do in the book is, when was the last time that a teacher went went to a seminar or something to study their actual discipline as opposed right. to the new standard for how they're supposed to, quote, manage their class? Right, exactly, exactly. American quackademia is focused on what I consider the claptrap of educational methodology. So in other words, school districts will pay you to go to conferences or require you in, in many cases to stay after school and attend the latest workshop where you basically are subjected to all sorts of childish activities that are passive aggressive in nature designed to make you be a team player and all of this, you know, cod swallop. But basically you would be hard pressed to find a teacher, say a, a teacher of English, that would be paid to go attend a conference in the latest scholarship in literary criticism or the latest findings on such and such an author, you know, in scholarly research, or if you're a mathematics teacher, going to a conference of mathematicians and hearing the latest papers in mathematics. They're not interested, in other words in the content of the disciplines that you are supposed to teach. What they're interested in is making the teacher a kind of equivalent to a paralegal. In other words, the teacher is now kind of a licensed parapsychiatrist who gets their certification in applying the latest psychological or educational theories in the classroom. And that's what they spend most of their time at these conferences, quote unquote, learning to do. Again, for me, this is a clear sign that that American education is failing simply because, you know, an English teacher is there to teach English, not to teach the latest psychological theory. So, you know, this is the other big problem that we're facing with all of this claptrap. There's another thing, since you raised this issue, that, that we learned about after the book came out. A teacher emailed me and said that she is absolutely refusing to go along with Common Core because it also stipulates a universal kind of lesson plan for the teachers in her school district. Mm -hmm. So in other words, whether this, whether or not this teacher's students are ready at a certain time to progress on to the next level of whatever discipline they're supposedly studying, she's mandated to proceed regardless. <laughs> so in other words, you know, what teacher can teach in an atmosphere like that? This is just another example of the centralization mania that is afflicting this country. And we know that centralization doesn't work mm -hmm. for the simple reason that every group of human beings from elementary school classrooms 
all the way up to Wall Street, every group of human beings is going to respond differently. So, uh, you know, the whole thing is is shot through with all of these assumptions that, as far as we're concerned, just mean that the whole thing is is a huge scam. It's not going to fix anything. The only thing it's going to do is make these companies even richer at the public trough. <laughs> yeah, well said. And those are pretty telling elements. And let's look at some of the, the people and the money behind this thing, because people mm-hmm. tend to think philanthropists like Bill Gates and their foundations who fund education are doing charitable works, just the best <laughs> altruistic stuff. But oh, of course, uh, what are the red flags that you see that tell you that there's a deeper agenda here? They don't have our best interests at heart. Well, first of all, the idea that these foundations are philanthropic is the first problem. What these foundations are, and we have a chapter in the book about foundations themselves and how they arose and what they really do. What they do educationally is they act as gatekeepers for the officially approved narratives is what they do. And they fund those who agree with those narratives and withdraw funding or keep funding from those who don't. So this is the first problem. The second problem with these foundations, and this is an observation that was not made by us. It was actually made by the council of the Reese Committee in the U.S. House of Representatives back in the 1950s that was investigating foundations, a fellow by the name of Rene Wormser. And Wormser made the observation that what these foundations in effect are, are the way that the wealthy can retain control of their wealth while putting them into a special chartered entity that avoids taxation because these are nonprofit entities. Mm. So in other words, it gives them a huge amount of power. And he made the observation that because of this phenomenon, the closest analog to them were the medieval military orders like the Templars or the Hospitallers Mm. or the, the Teutonic Knights. Because what were they? Well, they were essentially tax exempt charitable foundations. (laughs) that allowed the intergenerational accumulation of capital on the one hand and allowed the people that were members of that order, or in this case foundation, to control the uses of that capital and to drive political agendas. I look at Mr. Gates and his backing of Common Core with with a very jaundiced skeptical eye Hmm. for the very simple reason that, again, Under the computerized, individually adaptive assessment process, which again is is standardized testing on steroids now, what he's really doing is driving an agenda simply designed to put more and more profits into his computer technology companies. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. So this is not an education solution. There's even a case that we put in the book of a common core conference, a get together, where they invited everybody except guess what? Teachers. <laughs> <laughs> of you course. Know, they, they invited administrators and superintendents and principals and so on and so forth, but no teachers. Because of course that's where the rubber meets the road. And most teachers I've talked to are simply appalled at, at what they see in common core. So <laughs> again, you know, I really question whether or not these foundations really are philanthropic to begin with. I think all along they've been designed to promote the agendas of the super rich. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see where that's led us. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Not only is it better for them in terms of expanding wealth and power, as well as limiting liability, they also get the PR currency for all these, quote, noble deeds that nobody ever looks deeper on. Exactly. So if we go back a few years and look at who laid the foundation for what we have now and who should we be holding responsible, yeah. you paint a nice bold target on this Wilhelm Wundt character as well as John Dewey. Can you talk to us about them a bit and some of the history here? Well, this is very, very crucial for people to understand why American education, and, and I'll be just very blunt here, why American education sucks. <laughs> All right. uh, Wilhelm Wundt was basically one of the founders not only of psychology but of educational psychology and his philosophy was that if we were going to put psychology on any sort of scientific footing at all we had to be able to reduce it to a materialistic approach 
because only the material in that kind of nifty Cartesian dualism between matter and mind could be measured. You know, the mind was something that was personal, subjective, and all of that. It couldn't be measured. You couldn't take out a tape measure and measure it. So he began for want of a better expression, the materialistic turn in, in psychology. And he set up a laboratory at the University of Leipzig in Prussia at the time and began to churn out students that he had trained in this approach to psychology. And basically, it's very important to remember that Pavlov was one of his students because Wundt took the approach that because of the fact that the then reigning scientific paradigm was materialism, that humanity itself, the human being as an individual and humanity as a collective, was basically a stimulus response mechanism. So in other words, the educator had to design appropriate environments in the classroom. And this is why teacher certification here is now important and why I suggested earlier that the teacher is nothing but kind of a parapsychologist in in this view, because the teacher is supposed to design the most apt stimulus response environment for the student to learn in. So there's your turn away from the content of the discipline to a focus on the methodology of actually communicating that discipline in that context. So he trains a whole generation, either directly or through people that he has trained who then train others who influence American education at the end of the 19th century and all the way on into the 20th, and I would even include people like George S. Counts or or James Bryant Conant of Harvard University or even Henry Chauncey, who sets up the educational testing service in, in Princeton as people that were imbibed with this philosophy of humanity as a stimulus response mechanism. It works out very well if you have that philosophy for Madison Avenue and Wall Street, you know, because you're you're creating a generation of consumers rather than people who can think critically about anything. So it's it's had a huge, huge effect on American education. Now you mentioned Dewey, but there's a whole host of other people we could mention here. Thorndike, the fellow that I forget what his name was, Abraham Exner, I think was his name, that set up his own kind of progressive education school where he wanted to test some of these ideas and he called it the Lincoln School to give it a, a nice patriotic sounding American name mm-hmm. and we we bring out the fact that John D. Rockefeller sent his three sons David Lawrence and Nelson Aldrich to this school <laughs> where as a result of their experience all three of the Rockefeller brothers had difficulty reading They don't enjoy reading. In fact, they find it tedious. They find it difficult. Well, you know, I'm sorry. If if you're a member of the elite and you've sent your kids to that kind of school, then you're ending up with a stupid elite. (laughs) You know, and we're in an election cycle that certainly is proving that to be the point. You know, they've surrounded themselves with their own philosophy to the point that they can't even think outside their own narratives anymore. So this is the other danger of Common Core, I think, and the whole progressive education philosophy, the materialism that that underlies it. You're basically, to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, you're turning out a whole generation of men without chests. Mm -hmm. In other words, of of men without virtues or or moral principles or anything like that. And that is, uh, to my mind, that's the crucial component of being able to think critically about anything, about a narrative, and so on and so forth. So it's had a huge effect, this Wilhelm Wundt character. And, you know, the interesting thing here that we have to ask ourselves, Greg, is why would American educators at that time use an example of Prussian education Now, we're not even just talking, you know, imperial Wilhelmine Germany here. We're talking Prussian, Mm -hmm. where the whole philosophy of education under Wundt was we're turning out people to be good and obedient. (laughs) There's that key word and loyal products for the state, because Mm -hmm. the state is all consuming. The state is all powerful in the Prussian model. Why would Americans turn to that model as a 
thing that they want to model American education on. Mm -hmm. Why did they abandon the tradition that we had inherited from, you know, the Oxford universities in, in England and which played a huge role in setting up our own big name universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and so on. Why would we abandon that tradition for something inherently alien to our philosophy of government, to our philosophy of culture, to our understanding of individual liberties, and, and so on and so forth? Why would we do that? And the answer is, when you read these people, they really do believe in that Prussian philosophy. They really have abandoned their commitment to that Anglo-Saxon tradition of, of individual skeptical critical inquiry. So, you know, it, it's it's staring us right in the face if we stop and think about the obvious part of it. Mm -hmm. Well said. And I do love that Rockefeller anecdote because for once it looks like they actually got a little bit of a taste of their own medicine. And yeah, <laughs> it's nice to see that once in a while. But I guess, you know, you kind of alluded to this, but it does seem like that has shown itself in the game plan today. They don't seem to be quite as nimble or effective in some ways, or at least as quick to be able to pivot as they once were, wouldn't you say? Right. Well, well, I, yes, I, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. Several years ago on the late George Ann Hughes's radio show called The Bite Show, I pointed out that the so-called elite really seems to be very, very stupid. In other words, they are using the same playbook because they don't know anything else. They have dumbed themselves down in the process <laughs> of dumbing everybody else down to the point, And this is something that, that Catherine Fitz made me aware of last year. Last year in July, the Economist magazine in Great Britain, which, you know, most people think of as the magazine of record for the British oligarchy. All right. Well, last July in 2015, The Economist magazine ran an op-ed piece about the calcification, this is their words, not mine, the calcification of the American political class, and the effect of the article was, you're kidding, you're running Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton again? <laughs> you know, can't you guys come up with something different? Well, the answer is no, because, <laughs> because our own political elite has been calcified. It can't think outside of its own construct and its own box. And this, you know, uh, the election that we're seeing now, as far as I'm concerned, is really a referendum. Uh, it's not an election in any classic sense. It's really a referendum on do we want more of this global centralization and these idiots running the world and running it according to a paradigm that's never been tested or proven and seems to be breaking down under the strain, or do we want something different? I, I really look at it that way. And if you factor in education here and the materialist turn that it took in the 19th century, I think what you're looking at is the collapse of that materialist philosophy. These people are clinging to it, Greg, doggedly. <laughs> when science itself, particularly quantum physics, is increasingly pointing not toward a material primacy, but really towards the primacy of mind and of consciousness itself. Mm -hmm. So why would we stick to Bill Gates and these other people that are advocating the same old, same old on steroids and not reassess the basic philosophical principles that have led to this educational mess? <laughs> that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Greg, the way to solve it is, first of all, get rid of the requirement for teacher certification. It is to the point, you know, I have a Ph.D. from the oldest English-speaking university in the English-speaking world, all right? Now, incidentally, that university has never been accredited by any American accreditation agency, thank goodness. But I cannot go into a high school classroom and teach American history or European history or whatever because I don't have a teaching certificate mm. from some teacher's college where I spend time learning the latest educational claptrap and playing silly games. And quite literally, that's oftentimes what these courses consist of is playing games. Right. So we have to examine the whole structure as far as we're concerned. And this is really kind of what we were arguing in the book. We have to examine the whole structure itself. And, you know, we're in basic agreement with 
John Taylor Gatto, you know, the famous American teacher that's written so many books. Yes. And he's, you know, he's come right out and said the whole system has to be completely scrapped. No amount of money is going to fix this because the assumptions and the institutions put into place on the basis of those assumptions are completely fallacious. Mm hmm. Yeah. The, I mean, the elite are getting what they pay for. They built this yep. thing to churn out obedient workers and it's working just great. Yeah. Uh, you know, and now and now we have bank managers that can't balance a checkbook, you know, so it's no wonder that we have trillions of dollars unaccounted for at the Pentagon or in this bank or that bank. Because when you're dealing with stupid people, the immoral people, the greedy people, the criminal class can thrive. <laughs> right. And that, that can be a silver lining or an even scarier assertion, depending on your perspective. Precisely. <laughs> Precisely. Mm. So we have this campaign to dumb us down. And then we could also throw in this element of drugging us down, which is something that happened a oh, little yes. bit later, right? Yeah. Well, we don't talk about that much in the book, but that's quite true. I mean, I, I have known and dealt with people that are genuinely ADHD, adult attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I've, I've met and dealt with people like that. So I, I do think it does exist. However, I think the other problem here is that basically, and this is particularly true of little boys, less so of little girls, but Basically, they're diagnosing simple, you know, young male behavior all the time as ADHD, and they're drugging these kids with all sorts of stuff that basically turns them into zombies, mm -hmm. not in contact with their emotions, not in contact with their thought, and above all, not able to reason or think critically. This goes back to why I always insisted as a professor on giving essay exams, because it's in the act of writing that you you learn the art and craft of analyzing a position and arguing either against it or for your own position or for that position or what have you. It's in the act of writing that you're actually reasoning something, not simply spitting out an answer that the student is having to guess that the professor or the teacher or some hidden committee uh, compiling test questions for standardized tests wants. So for me, the critical thing as a professor back when I was teaching was to be able to see if someone was genuinely engaged intellectually with the subject matter and able to understand it and argue a position based on the facts and data that they had been presented. That for me was the key element. And you can't get that on a standardized test and certainly can't get it on a test that is now computerized, individually adaptive, according to the latest psychological theory, by a committee of test compilers in Princeton, New Jersey, or in Seattle, Washington, or wherever. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, the almighty infallible system, it's like... Yes, exactly. Right. They're t using the teachers as scapegoats and trying to say, you know, the yes. reason the schools suck is because these teachers, there's no standard. It's the teachers. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. You know, it's all the teachers' fault, you know? <laughs> And if anything, what this system has done, Greg, is it has created what I call the subversive teacher and the subversive student. Because there are, and if you're a teacher listening to this, and you probably have experienced this in your own career, because the system dictates to you that you have to do such and such by such and such a time and get such and such a result on such and such a standardized test. And you realize at some point when you're in the classroom teaching a group of people that this is simply not going to work for these people. So you teach your discipline to the best that you can. And it's in those subversive moments, usually between classes that you have with students who are beginning to ask the right kind of questions and question what is going on in the system, that you have those conversations that expose the whole thing. So in other words, you're creating an underground here that is trying to preserve what's left of the Western civilization and its traditions of education by content and discipline and critical reasoning ability. But you're working against a system that is designed not to do that. Mm -hmm. So you're literally creating a, a black market for these things. <laughs> and, and I suspect eventually that's what's going to happen.
Right. You're going to have a massive black market of private tutors, you know, of people that can afford it and want their kids to learn something and learn of value. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that this system does, and I'll be quite frank, and I saw this over and over again when I was teaching, the other thing that this system does is it produces waves of boredom, tidal waves, tsunamis of boredom. Right. Because most students are talked to at such a stupid level by the system that they know they're being talked down to. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I heard when I was a professor, Greg, you know, students would come up to me after the end of a course or something and say something to the effect that you're the first real professor I've had. Huh. Because I insisted at teaching at a genuinely collegiate level and not the dumbed down level that most professors now teach at in this country because the product that they're getting from the public education system is so colossally stupid. Witness and case in point, the student who can't spell Versailles <laughs> correctly when I've spelled it correctly in the test question itself. Right, <laughs> right. Know, they just don't make the connection. <laughs> Man. Yeah, in terms of the uh, the pharmaceutical initiative, that has got to be one of the best things that my parents did for me was reject those attempts to get me on that Adderall train because uh, they, yep. they were there. And um, yep. I have a note here that seems kind of disjointed, uh, maybe connected to that pharmaceutical initiative to ask you about the Society for the Investigation of Human Oncology. Um, oh, my. <laughs> this might be where some of the deeper nefarious agendas show up, I think. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was a CIA front back in the 1950s that was a CIA front for the mind control projects, you know, Project Artichoke, MK Ultra, and things like this mm -hmm. that was set up. They, in turn, approached the Educational Testing Service, you know, that huge nonprofit conglomerate that squats like, you know, a cancer in the middle of the American education system founded by Henry Chauncey and kind of wet nursed into existence by James Bryant Conant of Harvard University during the 50s. And of course, the Educational Testing Service is the service that owns the Scholastic Aptitude Test, you know, one of the famous standardized tests in this country. Well, they approached the Educational Testing Service to see if the service could design for them various tests related to personality and, and so on and so forth. So in other words, whatever the details of this association are, the implication here is that the CIA recognized the power of the tool of standardized testing as a tool of social engineering hmm. and therefore of mind manipulation. Now, I mention that because we point out in the book that this was really the reason that Henry Chauncey wanted to found the Educational Testing Service. He and, and James Bryant Conant had the idea that, well, we need to create a new kind of aristocracy in this country, an aristocracy of merit. And we're going to go search for the best and brightest people, and we're going to give them better education than the kind of education we're giving everybody else. And the way to do this is to test on a national level and to quote unquote test scientifically, so enter the standardized test. In other words, the test itself becomes a sorting mechanism. You get certain scores, you're eligible for certain scholarships, you're eligible for entrance into this major university instead of that little university out there in the plains of the Midwest somewhere and so on and so forth. So it becomes a tool of the American oligarchy to perpetuate their power and bring other people in. The problem is, of course, that they selected what can only be called a kind of computerized phrenology to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the old idea that you could measure a person's mental capacity by taking calipers and measuring, you know, <laughs> measuring the brain. When it's interesting to me because they even adopted the Iowa test of basic skills at one point. I remember seeing this as a kid, would have these calibers, these phrenology calibers as part of its logo stamped right on the test. Mm. So, you know, they've adopted a very blunt measurement instrument here to, to try and identify the more gifted students. And in 
illustration of this fact, we point out in the book a number of sample test questions from the 1960s in science, particularly in physics, which is kind of my, you know, my bailiwick, where the answers on the SAT that the educational testing service wanted were quite patently and simply wrong, okay? And they were taken to task at the time by a mathematician by the name of Banish Hoffman, who wrote a wonderful book called The Fallacy of Testing, all right? And Hoffman, just to let you know who he was, he was a member of the Institute for Advanced Study. He was a personal friend of Albert Einstein. So this guy is no fly by night. And he just absolutely savages the educational testing service on some of these questions. But he points out in one case, he had a student who had taken the SAT and also taken a test, a standardized test for a national merit scholarship in which the word intentionally appeared in a list of words which they were to identify as being misspelled. And the word intentionally was misspelled with an S, all right? And the Educational Testing Service, of course, wanted the students to identify this as the misspelled word. But the problem was this student was smart. This student had read the works of S.I. Hayakawa, on the nature of symbolic logic and and so on and so forth, where Hayakawa had intentionally misspelled that word to create a word that had a very specific technical meaning. Hmm. So in other words, the word wasn't misspelled and the student knew that it wasn't misspelled. He just knew more than the test preparers at the educational testing service. (laughs) Wow, wow. (laughs) Yeah, you see, so this is the problem. You can have a committee of experts, and there's always going to be some fallacy of the footnote somewhere that a bright student is going to be punished for knowing on the basis of these standardized tests because it puts them into the position of having to guess, do they know this or do they not know this? And if they don't know this, then I select this answer. But if they do know this, then I select another answer. Mm -hmm. So it's not a scientific measure of the student's intelligence. It's only a measure of whether or not they can guess what's in the mind of a committee that they don't even know. (laughs) And now Bill Gates wants to put all of this on computers and make the questions themselves individually adaptable by some algorithms and theories Of some anonymous committee? No. (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) Boom. There it is, man. Ah, So to get a little bit deeper and maybe also tie this into some other work that you've done, Mm -hmm. I've heard you discuss the fairly complex elements where we see the larger transhumanist agenda as well as a tie-in of ancient esoteric doctrine Mm -hmm. playing a huge role in the changes that they're making to us through the schooling system. Maybe you can elaborate on that a bit and help us understand this deeper crossroads. Well, I'm not quite certain as to what you're getting at, but my fear is that with this idea of individually adaptive, computerized, standardized tests, that what they're building out is basically two things. They're driving two memes into society. The first meme is, if it appears on a computer screen, it's true, which would be, you know, the 21st century equivalent of if Walter Cronkite said it on CBS Evening News, it's true, okay? Mm -hmm. Or if the New York Times says it, it's true, all right? Now, we see that mass media paradigm that held sway throughout the latter half of the 20th century breaking down. But what is being substituted in its place is if it's on the Internet, it's true. If it's on an ebook, it's true, and so on and so forth. So they're driving that meme. In other words, they're driving a dependency on machines, and they're driving a kind of intellectual passivity before the agenda here. But the other thing that they're doing, in my mind, Greg, is they're also trying to create, by means of driving that meme in, into society. They're trying to create the acceptability mm-hmm. of the merger of man and machine. And to me, that is the most disturbing thing because you see the transhumanists wanting to implant P2 
people with microchips and so on and so forth or download and upload memories into computers so that they can have their virtual immortality and, you know, all of this happy nonsense. To me, that's the most frightening thing because in that kind of environment, what you're taking out of the learning process itself is the human mentor, the teacher, the professor, what, whatever. You're taking out of the process the human element and you're substituting a very mechanistic element. You're reducing the student to a machine. You're reducing the student to an algorithm. And this is what I find to be the real heart of the problem here. And if we can go a step further and envision this philosophy in place, say, in the next century, well, why even bother having a school where you interact with other human beings. Why not just learn online at home? And there's some places doing this already. Mm -hmm. There's some places, you know, they're, they're not building libraries full of old fashioned things called books. And, you know, where you're interacting with other old fashioned things like students and teachers, you're doing this all online. Right. You know, I've got news for people. I write all of these books, but most of the information that are in my books, you cannot find on the internet. They're in old books. They're in obscure books. You know, they're in books that that you have to literally buy and mark and read. Right. So there are also the other transhumanist impulse. The third thing I think they're driving here is they are attempting by means of all of this to cut people off from their own culture and tradition. And to me, that is the central core of the problem. Because in the absence of a culture and tradition, basically anything goes. Right. Yeah, well said. Those definitely are major problems. And, you know, those old physical books can't be changed the way digital Kindle books can. Bingo, bingo, <laughs> bingo. Yeah. I tell people all the time, Greg, that the only canonical version, in other words, the only authoritative version of my books is the printed hard copy. It is not the, re you know, I format my books myself on my computer to look a certain way on the page. Mm -hmm. And that's all eradicated on an ebook. And more importantly, on an ebook, if you're using that as your source, what page do you cite? What's the page number that it's on? Right. You know, it, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. And I was taught when you're citing things, you cite as specifically as possible. So this is the other thing that they're doing in American education. I've, I've ranted and raved on this a lot. The standards now for citation of a text, the so-called MLA or, or AP style manuals, would not have been acceptable when I was going to public school as an accurate citation. When I cite, it's the author. It's the publisher. It's the place of publication. It was the year that it's published, the edition, if, if it's there, and the precise page on which you can find either the point I'm referencing or the quotation I'm using. But modern methods of citation, oftentimes, particularly in education departments, believe it or not, don't require you to cite the page. You simply cite the author and the year. And then you have to flip back to the biography, and there you find, lo and behold, you're citing a 500-page book and just telling the poor person on the other end, go read this 500-page book. It's in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to me, this is, uh, you know, if I were to have received or submitted a paper like that when I was in high school, guess what grade I would have received for it? <laughs> Not a good one. Not a good one. <laughs> Mrs. Connors in my world lit class in Lincoln Senior High School in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, would have handed that paper back to me with a great big red letter F, <laughs> and rightly so. But this is how the standards have changed right? since I was going to school to what's happening now. Students aren't even aware of the fact that what they're being taught in terms of citations itself is slipshod. They're not even aware that there was another method that demanded extreme accuracy from citation. And the reason it demanded it is that's just common courtesy. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're devolving on all sides, man. It's yes, sad we are. To see. <laughs> yes, we are. Um, so an another note I had here about 
where this might tie into, I guess, potentially the elite belief systems <laughs> is that they want to reverse the stages of esoteric man or the levels of Adam and return to androgyny. Yes. Uh, can you get into that a little bit? Well, that's not something we actually covered in the Common Core book. Right. But I, I had a co-author in a book. Uh, his name is Dr. Scott DeHart. He's also in education. And we wrote a book called Transhumanism, and the subtitle is A Grimoire of Alchemical Agendas, because there's a basic kind of esoteric doctrine of mankind that you find in various esoteric systems. And we, we kind of had to boil it all down. But basically, there's four stages of the devolution of man. And this, this is very important for people to understand. The ancient cosmological system, as opposed to the modern one, was not a system of evolution, but of devolution. All right. Uh, evolution assumes, you know, eternal upward progress, uh, the survival of the fittest and so on and so forth. Devolution assumes that we were once much higher in terms of our intellectual and moral capacity than we are now. So there were essentially four stages in that conceptual scaffolding for the devolution of man. At the top and most advanced stage, there was this idea of the androgyne. In other words, mankind in his truest form combined both sexes into kind of a chimerical creature. Mm -hmm. And then mankind begins to fall, so to speak, into materiality. And during that fall, of course, the sexes become divided. So the next lower stage would be mineral man, you know, the fall into inert matter. And then the next stage lower than that would be vegetable man. And then the lowest stage would be animal man, which is what we are now. Hmm. All right. So you you have in that ancient cosmological view, if you look at it carefully, there are certain features of it that resemble the modern one in that there's a kind of immaterial pre-existence. And then you have the beginning of inert matter then you have the appearance of simple life in the form of vegetative life, and then you have the emergence of more complex life. So in that sense, it does resemble the modern cosmology. But if you look carefully at some of the esoteric doctrines, and in particular alchemy, what you see is an attempt to reascend the ladder and to go back up to the state of androgyny, which is the highest expression of man. Well, I suspect, although, I again, I want to stress here, Greg, I have no evidence for this, but I suspect that what lurks behind the drive of so many people in the progressive movement in various countries is that there's a solid core of people who have a very different agenda from what they're telling people publicly and that what they're trying to do is to socially engineer society in order to reach back and achieve that state of androgynous consciousness. I think this is what's driving this war against the sexes, be it male or female. I note I said sexes, not gender. That's another little fast switcheroo hmm. that they've, that they've played on us. You know, I remember filling out forms when I was a kid. What's your sex? Are you male or female? But now it's gender, and gender is a linguistic property. It's not a sexual one. You know, yeah. there's ge there's genders in in the inflected languages like Greek or Latin or Russian or German or Spanish or French and so on. Sexuality is very very different. So they're pulling a kind of a fast one with this gender agenda because what they're trying to do, in my opinion, is engineer a kind of sex free or to put it even more accurately, androgynous consciousness. Hmm. And that I find very, very disturbing because once you get people to accept this and get them living in a world of linguistic virtual reality rather than in the real world, then you've severed people away from, from a mooring that can anchor them in reality and you're creating a situation where almost anything goes. I, you know, this to me is very, very disturbing. You see it almost everywhere now. And to me, sexuality is one of those things that grounds you in reality. In fact, it's probably the thing that grounds you in reality. Hmm. So I find 
that whole agenda very, very, you know, don't take me wrong here. I'm not against gay people or transgendered people or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this linguistic agenda of theirs is ultimately going to hurt everybody, no matter where you fall Mm -hmm. on the sexual spectrum. That's my point. It's a linguistic agenda. It's a creation of a kind of virtual reality that benefits no one in the long run. Yeah, man. Well said. And that high octane speculation, that kind of stuff, that is the sweet spot for me. It's a bit over my head at times, but so interesting. And I like the way you break that stuff down. So I want to get into uh, your other book that came out this year. But before we close out on the education topic, what Uh sort of advice would you have for teachers or even parents who are being made aware of these problems and need some better options for their kids? Well, the first thing I would I would advise is we are to the point, I think, socially and culturally and as a civilization, where we are just going to have to stand up and say no. We're fast approaching the time that we are going to have to make some very hefty decisions on what we're willing to die for. And I'm putting it that bluntly because I believe the crisis is fast approaching that state of profundity. Mm. But the other thing I think that people, that once you've made that determination, that you're just going to stand up and say no to all of this, that the next thing you have to do is start to organize how can we resist all of this in a way that is, so to speak, particularly in this country, constitutionally approved. And the way I would suggest is that individual states now need to appoint special attorneys, prosecutors, or whatever you wish to call them, that will, will on the basis of 10th and 14th Amendment, and so on and so forth, assert the right of state sovereignty against federal mandates. Mm. Whatever federal mandates may come down in all of these, you know, huge omnibus bills that nobody in Congress reads, these have to be challenged all the way up to the Supreme Court. Just tie them up in litigation. We saw something of that effort with Obamacare, but as far as I'm concerned, they rolled over way too early with that. They should keep harping on that, but every other federal mandate, you know, the forced vaccinations, Common Core, you know, everything that is tied to a federal mandate of how states must spend their money should now be tied up in litigation. Absolutely. Mm. That, to me, is the most practical way in the short term that I think that we can respond to some of this stuff and start fighting this this trend towards massive global centralization, which, as we can see, isn't working anywhere. (laughs) (laughs) It's not working in Europe. It's not working here. It didn't work in Russia. The Russians learned that lesson. So, you know, they're the ones crying the loudest lately about (laughs) this trend towards Mr. Global and and letting multinational corporations run everything, over and over you're hearing from Russia that, no, there is the sovereign nation is not obsolete. Thank you very much, (laughs) Mr. Rockefeller and Mr. Brzezinski. And by golly, we're going to stick to it and we're going to defend our country and we're going to defend our culture. (laughs) And incidentally, isn't it interesting that Russia, Russia is playing host to this year's International Homeschooling Conference, mm. <laughs> Russia. Now, turn the clock back 30 years, folks, and ask yourself if that would have been possible in Brezhnev's or Chernyenko's or Andropov's or even Mr. Gorbachev's Russia. No, <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> so in other words, it's like we're in this upside-down world here. The United States is looking progressively more and more like the United Socialist States of America, the USSA, and Russia, you know, they even proudly display the Romanov eagle on their flags half the time. Russia is embarked on this weird new experiment in culture and and nationhood, uh, a kind of post-postmodern experiment, as I like to call it. <laughs> So, you know, we're just looking at this huge inversion that's, that's taken place. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It does seem quite backwards. I mean, the whole schooling system does. And it seems like we're going to have to resort to handing out those secret passwords to the underground educational speakeasies before too long. 
Well, oh yes, I, I, I definitely think, Greg, I definitely think that's coming. Oh no. Uh, you know, already homeschooling has grown in this country enormously in the past few years. I think what's going to happen eventually is that those teachers in the pub, I, I met a teacher just three weeks ago, Greg, that told me that she quit teaching because she just could not stand Common Core because she had to conform to a lesson plan schedule that she hadn't even made for her own students. Mm. <laughs> now, when you know, tell me that you can centralize things to that point. So what happens is you're driving out the good teachers from the education system, and trust me, eventually the people that can afford it are going to start picking up those teachers, and you're going to see a, a collapse of the system simply due to market pressures. Mm -hmm. because this system that we have now that we've erected since, you know, the turn of, uh, of the late 19th century, this system isn't working. It's producing a bumper crop of stupid people mm. who yeah. are more focused on the latest football game than they are on the constitution or on physics or mathematics or literature or music or whatever. And by music, incidentally, folks, I don't mean the latest band. <laughs> you know, I, I mean something going back a couple hundred years. Right, right. So, you know, we have a bumper crop of idiots in this country. And more and more, I think the people that have the money recognize this. And they're simply pulling their kids out of this public education nightmare. And again, that's, that comes down to just saying no. Mm. Amen. You said it, man. So... To segue over into Hidden Finance, Rogue Networks, and Secret Sorcery, the fascist <laughs> international 9-11 and penetrated operations, I have to say that doing a show like this over the years, I've gotten a little bit of 9-11 fatigue, whether by, <laughs> whether by accident or design or a little bit of both. Um, it's kind of like Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump fatigue. I know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Touche. And, you know, after having Dr. Judy Wood here and making her case for exotic energy weapons being used on the Twin Towers, I kind of expected to close the books on it for a while. But you dig up some really interesting stuff in your investigation. It's got to be talked about and it can be complex. But just give us a little overview of the Joseph Farrell approach to the 9-11 events. Well, my approach is essentially similar to other 9-11 truth researchers, but my conclusions are very, very different. Mm -hmm. In any criminal investigation, particularly where murder is involved, you want to know what the murder weapon is. Right. And in the case of the Twin Towers, if you look at the 9-11 truth community, there has been literally a, an inability of people to talk to each other civilly. You know, you mentioned Dr. Judy Wood. Well, there are some people out there in the 9-11 truth community that absolutely hate her. <laughs> True. You know, for proposing the idea. Right. We should be on the same side. Yeah. And, and you know, how she manages to keep her head and to remain courteous to these people, I just don't know. But, but you know, they, they've come up with some of the most ludicrous criticisms of her. You know, I read one guy proposing the model of mini nukes as the mechanism for the destruction of the Twin Towers, just absolutely raking her over the coals because she didn't provide a model for how she thought this exotic energy weaponry would work. Well, my question back to him is, explain to me how a mini nuke works. What's the critical mass? What's the nuclear fuel? What's the neutron cross section? What's the half-life? And so on and so forth. And they'd never do this. So, you know, it's tit for tat as far as I'm concerned. What she's trying to do is simply propose a model that she thinks makes sense of certain amounts of the evidence. And the same with the mini nuke people and the same with controlled demolition people and so on and so forth. My approach to the question of the murder weapon is that why must we conclude when we have evidence for all of these models and all of these models have certain problems? Mm -hmm. also all right so my approach is is it's kind of like the old agatha christie novel murder on the orient express you know they made a movie out of this with uh, peter ustinov and at the end of the movie you know like all agatha christie books the detective in this case Hercule poirot gets everybody together in a room and gives the solution you know wraps it all up in a neat tidy package with a bow on it 
Hmm. Well, in the case of murder of, on the Orient Express, what you had was a case of everybody murdering the victim, <laughs> but using a different way to do it. <laughs> so in other words, this to me describes the 9-11 truth community perfectly because they've all assumed that there's only one level of deeper player involved in 9-11, and therefore the murder weapon must reflect that player. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is that even at the deep level of the operation, that you might have been dealing with a penetrated operation and that there might be even deeper levels than a second level rogue network operating inside the American government. And how would they signal their presence? Well, if they penetrated an operation in which they knew that some of the mechanisms to take down the Twin Towers would be either controlled demolitions or nanothermite or mini nukes, you know, the three, the three standard ones that most 9-11 truthers accept. Well, how would you signal your presence to that group and pin it to its own plan like a chess pin? Well, you do so by using a technology that signaled to that group that planned and orchestrated the event that signaled to them that they were facing another player that had just revealed itself. Okay, and this is what I think actually happens. You do have, I think, enough signatures of some sort of exotic technology there at 9-11 that fall outside the three standard mechanisms of controlled demolitions, be it standard explosives, nanothermite, or mini nukes. I do think that Dr. Wood is absolutely correct on this. So the real question is, what does that signify in terms of the perpetrators? Well, to me, it signifies that you're dealing with three levels, not two. You're dealing with the patsies, you know, the people flying the airplanes into the buildings. At a deeper level, you're dealing with a rogue network within the American intelligence community that had the capacity to plan the event and to plant controlled demolitions or had access to many nukes or nanothermite and so on and so forth. And what's their goal? Well, their goal is to do exactly what happened, to inject American power into the Middle East. And this is what they did. But the problem there is, as I've always thought, Greg, is you wouldn't have needed to destroy those buildings, you would only have needed to severely damage them in order to create enough of a climate of opinion to inject American power in that way. It's when the buildings come down with whatever exotic technology that brings them down that you're dealing with a penetrated operation. And particularly, I think, if Dr. Wood is correct, and I happen to think she is, you know, I've adhered to the exotic weaponry hypothesis myself since 9-11 happened. You know, I watched it happen. So that was my first thought when I saw what happened. So, you know, she's not alone. She certainly is kind of out there alone on her own trying to defend the hypothesis, but she's certainly not the only one that advocated it. There was another gentleman that, that did so years before she published her book. And then he later retracted it. But, you know, I review what he said in my book very carefully. So I'm looking at a Hercule Poirot, Agatha Christie, murder on the Orient Express type of thing where everybody, <laughs> you know, everybody essentially is in on the movie, but they're in on the murder, I should say, but using a different murder weapon. Yeah. Oh, man. I really find this penetration pretty exciting. You know, I guess like most penetrations, but, um, you know, to, to break down the three levels, you say level one, we have the patsies, the hijackers, right. the official narrative right. level two, we have the planners from within the American military apparatus. Right. There's gotta be some. And then thirdly, this fascist international right. group who seem to flip the script on the other two right. at, uh, at some point. That is the best and most succinct summary of the position I take. And the reason, and the people are going to think fascists. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're going to think, well, what in the name of sense is he talking about? Well, in researching the 9-11 phenomenon, I noticed something that, again, just mystifies me that the 9-11 truth community researchers don't pursue. You know, I found this in doing the JFK book. Right. 
Whenever they're confronted with a mysterious fascist connection, what do they do? They don't investigate. So let's look at what that connection is. And most people, you know, when I found this, Greg, my jaw, I, I literally was sitting here in my place, you know, no one else is in the room. And I just said out loud, you're kidding. Me. <laughs> and I dug a little deeper and I, I thought again, you've got to be kidding me, you know? So I'm just putting out there what I found. All right. Let's begin with what happens after 9-11 when the 9-11 truth community goes into full skepticism mode of the official narrative. One of the first things that they find, a fellow by the name of Douglas Hopsicker did a book called Terrorland. All right. It's all about the flight school that Mohammed Atta and some of his cohorts attended in Venice, Florida. All right. Okay. And... He found, first of all, a quotation by the then British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, where Blair said that Al-Qaeda is nothing but a global network. Okay? <laughs> now, global network implies something right off the bat. Number one, financing. Number two, organization. And number three, deep, deep connections. Right. So who could that be? Now, when he says network, he could have said power. But he doesn't say anything to indicate that it's a particular nation involved, be it the Saudis, the Israelis, the Russians, the United States, nobody. He just says network. So I dig a little further, and I find an interesting quotation by a Russian economist by the name of Dr. Tatiana Koryagina that appeared in Pravda. Uh, Jim Mars dug this one up. And she stated, and this was approximately, I think, a couple of months before 9-11, and again, my memory is a little foggy, it may have been a couple months after, but in any case, within the window, she says that the United States is going to be attacked on its own soil in a kind of fake terrorist attack, but really it's coming from a group, a small group of very powerful people, a network, she calls it, which has in excess of $30 trillion huh. at its disposal to recreate the world the way they want. Pretty on the nose. Yeah, pretty on the nose. I'm thinking, okay, here we have Tony Blair says it's a network, and we have a Russian economist writing in Pravda that says it's a network, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's not a country. So in other words, we're dealing there right off the bat with a kind of Prima facie indication that there's a third level to this thing that exceeds any particular nation state player, including rogue groups within American intelligence. Now, they can certainly be connected to that third network. We're going to get to that. <laughs> so I'm reading Daniel Hopsicker's book called Murder in Terrorland or something. I forget the exact title of the book right off the top of my head. Excellent book. Hopsicker goes down and he investigates the flight school in Venice, Florida, and he investigates none other than Mohammed Atta. OK, and he points out something that floored me. He points out that most of Mohammed Atta's friends that would come to visit him weren't Arabs. They were people with names like Jürgen, Hans, Wolfgang, <laughs> and so on. So, you know, my suspicion needle immediately begins to creep into the yellow zone. So I do a little more digging, and you discover that Mohammed Atta comes to this country from guess where? He comes to this country from Hamburg, Germany, where he had been living for a number of years with an unnamed, and nobody to my knowledge to this date has named this German couple in a middle-class neighborhood in Hamburg, Germany. Dig a little further. <laughs> you find that Mohammed Atta was recruited by, again, an anonymous German couple when he was in Cairo. Well, recruited for what? And why Germans? You know, why not the Muslim Brotherhood? Why not, you know, the Saudis and the Wahhabis? Why not Hamas? Why not Hezbollah? But no, <laughs> Germans. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, to me, right there, Greg, what what this should have sparked in the 9-11 truth community was a tremendous amount of curiosity. Why is that connection there? And why has nobody investigated it? 
Well, I'll tell you why they probably did do a little investigating, but were a little hesitant to go there. <laughs> Dig a little further into Mohammed Atta, and you discover that during his years in Germany, he was sponsored by a society called the Karl Duisberg Gesellschaft. And when I found that, Greg, the suspicion needle went from yellow to red. Right. Okay, on my suspicion meter. Because Carl Duisberg was one of the founding members. He was the head of Bayer during World War I. Mm. Okay, that should tell you what this guy is. He becomes a founding member of IG Farben and sits on the board. Okay? <laughs> now, this means that Mohammed Atta is being sponsored in Germany by a society named for one of the founders of IG Farben. So my suspicion meter goes a little further into the red zone. It's got to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's got to, you know. And you dig into the Carl Duisberg Society and you find, oh, it's a wonderful society sponsored by people like Bill Clinton and Henry Kissinger and, you know, all these big German industrialists and so on and so forth. So we have a society sponsoring Mohammed Atta named after an IG Farben Society member that's connected to all of these, let's be honest here, globalists, all right? So I dig a little further. I find out that there's a banker involved in all of this by the name of Francois Genoud, G-E-N-O-U-D. He is a Swiss-French banker. He was the banker of record for the estates of Adolf Hitler, for Josef Goebbels. He handled all the Nazi accounts in Switzerland during and after, <laughs> that's a huge <laughs> clue, after the war. And oh, looky, looky, he has ties to this post-war Nazi international I've been talking about. And oh, looky, looky, he just happens to be the bankroller for a number of international terrorist groups. And oh, looky, looky, he just happens to be the banker for guess who? The Bin Laden family. Ah, uh, of course. <laughs> ah, that connected them to guess what? Deutsche Bank. Okay. <laughs> so, in other words, I'm looking at all of this, Greg, and I'm seeing this suspicious German connection here that nobody, and I, I mean that quite literally, that nobody to my knowledge, has ever brought up in connection with this unnamed global network that Tony Blair and Tatiana Coriogana suggested. And the problem here is, whether we like it or not, when we're dealing with Francois Genoux, we're dealing with a man who lived on up into the 1990s. And he was deeply connected to all of these different fascist groups. So it does look to me like we're dealing yet again with some sort of uh, global, for want of a better expression, fascist mafia that is behind this. Now, the problem is, could this be the group that would have had access to an exotic energy technology such as Dr. Wood or the fellow that I review in the book have suggested might have been involved as one of the quote-unquote murder weapons. Well, if you've read any of my books about this, this post-war Nazi international, you'll discover that all along I've been arguing that this group, when it fled Europe at the end of World War II, deliberately made an effort to retain control of its most exotic and advanced hidden research black projects and simply relocated all of these initially to South America. So over time with enough money and so on, could such a group have access to technologies like that? Well, we have to look at none other than, than the Secretary of Defense, William Cohen, under Bill Clinton, who at a conference said, yes, we, we are very worried that terrorist groups are going to get their hands on some of these exotic weapons and be, be able to manipulate weather or create earthquakes and so on and so forth. So He's implying by the nature of the case right there that there's an exotic energy technology that is not in the hands of any one sovereign nation. It's in the hands of somebody else. So, you know, connect the dots at one end and, and the other. And I think you see what the picture is. Right. Great summary. And it is a tangled web for sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was 
when I found out this stuff about Muhammad Atta, Greg, I was just dumbfounded. Yeah. You know, it was confirmation of an intuition that I had when 9-11 happened. You know, we were all glued to the television set. And it, to me, it was like, you know, I, I, I was a boy during the JFK assassination. And it was like deja vu because, you know, the, already they were putting out a certain spin, a certain storyline. But I was, as I was watching all this, I was thinking, no, it doesn't make sense. There's something much, much deeper going on here. And, right. You know, the other aspects of 9-11 only seem to confirm this. <laughs> Webster Tarpley for a number of years, and I think quite rightly, has been arguing that 9-11 has aspects of a coup d'etat, if you look closely. Yes. And, and the, you know, a narrowly avoided coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, coupled with this Mohammed Atta connection to, to, you know, IG Farben societies and international bankers with ties to the Saudis and the Bin Ladens, you know, <laughs> everything else, it's it's a very, very murky picture. So, yeah, 9-11, you know, I, I was kind of like you, Greg, when I decided to write the book. It was, well, do I do I write this and put it out there or do I fall victim to my own sense of 9-11 exhaustion? And <laughs> I, I just decided, well, no, it's it's time to put this out there because there may be another way of looking at this whole thing that even the 9-11 truth movement hasn't really considered. Right. And I'm I'm so glad you did put it out there. But as we start to wrap this up, by the time this show airs, because I don't think we're going to get it out in time, it's going to be close, but we'll most likely know who the next president is. And on the plus side, we can actually get through all this drama. But as I've been reading your 9-11 breakdown and hearing about these multiple levels and the notion that it seems like the fascist international network has somewhat broken off from the American machine, as it seems to be declining in its usefulness, I'm curious how you see this relating to the supporters of the two horses in the presidential race or the back and forth FBI investigation of Clinton or really anything between the lines of what we're seeing in the mainstream news. Well, I've, I've said all along that my approach to this election and the two candidates, first of all, I view this election not simply as an election. I view it as a referendum on two very, very different ideologies of the future one is one ideology is the standard globalist mantra of the obsolescence of the nation state uh you know the multicultural agenda the the centrality model and everything being run by big corporations for the glorious benefit of the big corporations and the other candidate represents an ideology opposed to this centralizing model that is reasserting the sovereignty of, of the nation state, the centrality of having a culture and, and protecting and defending it. And when you look at it in that fashion, and I've, I've been saying this, you know, for a number of months now since, since Donald Trump emerged as, as the Republican nominee, what I think you see is these two candidates really represent two factions of the American deep state that are battling it out right. behind the scenes. You know, I've made no bones. I, I call Trump the mafia candidate <laughs> because you, you cannot be in the business he's in, particularly where he's, you know, done most of his business without having to have had at some point in your business dealings, dealings with what we now call the mob or the mafia. Now, there's one thing about the American mafia that people forget, and that is it is intensely patriotic, has been traditionally so. And he, therefore, to me, represents that segment of the American deep state that's looked at these globalists and neocons and seen nothing but a track record of disaster. And particularly in, in the mafia's case, with Obamacare and everything else, so gutting the leisure capital of the middle class, this is cut very, very heavily into the casino business. If you go out to Vegas and places like that, business is dramatically down from where it used to be. So he represents, you know, a segment of, of that economic interest that is looking at this track record and seeing things are not going the way that they should. 
So I view this as, as a contest really between not only different opposing ideologies, but different factions within the American deep state. Now, it's interesting that just, I think, yesterday, Greg, it was that Dr. Stephen Pachenik, a psychiatrist that has had dealings with and, and been part of the CIA, just came out with a YouTube video where he said that, in effect, what you're seeing now is a soft counter coup against Hillary Clinton and the globalists by a group of people within the American military intelligence community that are deeply dissatisfied with the direction that things have been going for the last 30 years under under the Bush-Clinton nexus. And again, that plays very well to what I said earlier about the Economist magazine op-ed piece about the British, you know, looking at this election back in 2015 and seeing nothing but the calcification of the American political class and, and no new solutions, just the same old, same old, and more of it. And, you know, I think the Brexit vote in a certain sense was the British deep state taking stock of, of where this is all going and deciding, you know, we want out of it and we're going to go a different direction. So there's a lot riding on this election. There's much more going on here, I think, than meets the eye behind the scenes. And to, to put the icing on the cake for that analysis, I began to get very, very, I, would, I won't say suspicious, but in a certain sense to, to have this kind of analysis confirmed by the way Donald Trump dealt with Jeb Bush and dealt with Senator Cruz. Because you'll recall during the, the Republican primary season, he came out as they were debating with that statement against Jeb Bush, where he actually succeeded in injecting part of the 9-11 truth narrative into the political debate, mm -hmm. you know, by questioning the Bush family's potential role in it. Yeah. Now, that was huge because what and he did it with a sense of finesse and timing that I don't think many people appreciate because Bush's candidacy was already failing. And that just injected the final coup de grace and Bush dropped out within days of that remark. Huh. And I think it was because, you know, by someone of Trump's stature injecting that into the mainstream meant that they could no longer take refuge behind the official narrative. And then what happened to Senator Cruz? Well, he dropped that little bombshell about Senator Cruz's father having been in New Orleans and in the circle of people that surrounded Lee Harvey Oswald. And therefore, you know, he was, he was making the implicit connection of Senator Cruz to the JFK assassination. Well, as a response to this, of course, Senator Cruz began by denying and, and, and so on and so forth. But eventually, the researchers were able to, to show that Senator, Senator Cruz's father really was in New Orleans and apparently did have some sort of loose networked connection to that whole circle of goings on down there. So what happened to Senator Cruz? Well, his donations began to fail dramatically after that statement. And sooner rather than later, he drops out of the race. <laughs> now, what that signals to me is that somebody is feeding Donald Trump with a lot of intelligence and a lot of careful studied practice on when and how to drop those li little zingers yeah. into the conversation. Uh, besides the fact that I strongly suspect that Trump himself is an individual that would be inclined to, to question official narratives and read things on his own. So I think this is coming from a twofold source within the Trump campaign. I think he's being fed intelligence and he's being carefully steered as to how and when he drops these little zingers into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And he's not afraid of doing so, you know. He's dropped a number of zingers into the presidential debates. He dropped a, quite a few zingers in, in that joint dinner with um, Cardinal What's-His-Name right. that he, that he and, and Hillary appeared at. Uh, he's, he's done this repeatedly. And this, this plus the fact that Stephen Pachenik has come out with this soft coup, this soft coup video of his suggests to me by way of a kind of confirmation that, yes, there's some sort of – ad hoc intelligence 
presence in the Trump campaign uh, that is very, very dissatisfied with with what Clinton represents, which is basically more of the same Bush Clinton stuff that we've had for the last 30 years. Yeah. So there's a lot going on in this election, Greg, behind the scenes. You know, your guess is as good as mine or people's guesses out there as good as mine. But that's kind of that's kind of my take on, on, on what's happening. Yeah, man. I love the way you read between the lines. But wow, Joseph, always, always a highlight for me to get you here to do this. You break down these complex situations with such clarity. I think you set a serious gold standard for the conspiratorial research community. And I'd have you here every month if I could. But uh, before we call it in, remind everyone where they can dig deeper into your work and even support you as a member of your website. Uh, my website is www.gizadeathstar, that's all one word, dot com. Um, all of my books are there in the web store. Um, there is a members area there if they want to support. There, there's a PayPal donation button there if they want to make donations without becoming members or do both. Uh, the members area, I have a number of, uh, quite a number actually of, of videos that are strictly in the members area. I have a number of what I call webinars where I, I talk about various things of interest to my members or to me and, and just kind of do little seminars on them. So they can, they can do either one of those. Awesome. Well, another one in the can. I can't thank you enough. Keep fighting the good fight out there. All right, my man. All right. Thank you for having me back, Greg. You got it. All right, people. Joseph P. Farrell, always, always one of my favorites. He spent an extra half hour with me, so big thanks to him. Two extended episodes, back to back. How about that, guys? <laughs> Some people have asked where the newsletter is, and it is behind because I'm trying to launch T-Shirt Brand 2.0, and I want to include that in the newsletter instead of having to wait another month or send out two stupid emails, and we're close. We're real close, so I'm trying to roll it all up into one thing. But as for this show... I definitely find the Common Core stuff really creepy, and I'm glad, so glad, that I don't have kids right now. I'm also very lucky that the person I'm marrying is on board with some type of alternative schooling, but we still don't want to raise no weirdos. So you gotta be careful. It can be a slippery slope. But the aspect of these computerized, personally adaptable tests and this data collection tie-in where the data can be sold to corporations and they can analyze it a thousand different ways and cater marketing specifically to you for the rest of your life? No good. When these nefarious companies have basically all these little sub-companies under their umbrella, they're going to use it any way they can, this data. Teachers have no power. Parents have no power. The material is proprietary. It's a creepy direction for education to be going in, and I'm glad Joseph decided to tackle it. Same with 9-11. So many people say it's the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, Israel. And there is a Jewish sector, but I just don't know if it holds as much power as it did in the Rothschild days. I think there's really something to this powerful post-war Nazi cabal and where we've seen their influence. But it's not an either or. I've been listening to a lot of Robert Anton Wilson lately. I think he's just a really compelling speaker. I like Manly P. Hall too, but he was just a few decades too soon for quality audio recordings. The ones I get are usually pretty poor. But anyway, Robert Anton Wilson, he reiterates several times in this lecture that I was listening to that no model can encompass everything, which is also kind of his beef with conspiracy folks is their narrow models. But it is true. There's always going to be something left out. I try to stay away from those types of absolute statements for just that reason. But in this context, I mention it only because if you think a lot of control comes from one area, don't have blinders on to other areas. I fully think we have a Jew thing going on, a Jesuit thing that's pretty serious, a triple crown control problem, overarching archonic influence, and a Nazi fascist international network. And even that model wouldn't include everything. You got your think tanks, you got your secret societies, you got your multinationals. It's a tangled web for sure, but that's okay. I like to think that at least. As the show progresses, we examine all threads pretty equally. But I'm wrapping this thing up soon. It's actually 6 p.m. my time on election night. The electoral votes right now are Trump 60, Clinton 44, 
I'm looking at a popular vote of Trump 51%, Clinton 46%. I would be really, really shocked if Hillary didn't win because I'm just so used to the boring thing happening. Trump would definitely be the chaos candidate. I don't think he's pure by any means, but he definitely would be the more exciting chaos candidate if that's what you're looking for. And I don't even know that that's what I'm looking for. I'm just saying. When you look at the way the media has basically completely ignored the Podesta emails and the Clinton Foundation stuff and instead said that Trump is so scary, I mean, every celebrity, every media host, it's all just about how scary Trump is and how... We have to hold our nose and vote for Clinton. I mean, everybody. I I can't remember a time when people have been so aggressive about telling audiences who to vote for and how disastrous, how apocalyptic the other candidate would be. I mean, I, I know this happens to a degree, but I think we can all acknowledge that there's something different going on this time. So there is an argument to be made that why would they set that trap not to use it? You drill into everyone's head how dangerous it will be if X happens, and then you don't make X happen? I don't know. There's the argument that the elite are changing the game up, and this might parallel the Brexit vote, where everybody goes to bed positive it's going to go one way, they wake up and it goes the other way, with the nationalistic choice. Yeah, that's possible. But those options are too chaotic for boring old America. We're getting Clinton. I'm saying it right now. By morning, I might completely regret even talking about it, but that's what I see happening. But as for those Podesta emails, yeah, they're creepy, and I'm sure we'll be getting into that in a full show once I feel confident that it's all out there and we can talk about it in full. But if you do want to hear more THC right now, the Plus Show today is excellent. All the 9-11 stuff was going to be the Plus Show, but since Joseph gave me an extra half hour, we got to at least introduce everybody to his 9-11 analysis. We did go deeper in the Plus Show, and then we talk about CERN and the secret agenda behind the Large Hadron Collider and how it relates to this fascist international network, the Nazi bell, and the -the off-the-books physics we've talked about before. We also talked about other areas where we've seen some of these exotic technologies tested. The Malaysian Airlines disappearance, the Bermuda Triangle, the Norway Spiral, all might be examples of it. I also loved, loved, loved the talk about Fighting in the Middle East might be over cuneiform tablets and ancient technologies buried in Babylon, and that might have been the coded language of weapons of mass destruction and that whole meme. Provocative stuff indeed. We also revisited the nefarious corporation SAIC that we talked about in the Camellio episode with Robert Guffey because Joseph Farrell relayed some super strong and sketchy connections they have to 9-11, so they need to be on the radar, guys. Fuck SAIC but all great stuff. I hope you'll support the show by becoming a Plus member. The free seven-day offer is still going strong, but sign up and get the full length and girth of the higher side chats. But I'm going to get out of here and find out who's going to take this wheel as we watch the shadowy puppet masters drive us right into the ground. See you next time. Your move, Nazi Fascist International Network and the Common Core Cabal. Your fucking move. Oh no. You see, the world isn't random, it's attached to puppet strings, control over everything. A nine to five is trying to steal ya, now don't that job seem silly? Hello, can you hear me? Or should I play back? Some spike agency Wish we were younger And free I'll be thankful when it's all exposed The vast conspiracy There's such a difference Between us And the dead
cartoons It's so typical of me to talk about this stuff I'm sorry, that's good And well Did you ever hear the argument That nothing really happens It's no secret And that the best is plus It's double your time Hey guys, thanks for listening to the first hour of the Higher Side Chats podcast with me, Greg Carlwood. If you don't know, there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here. Generally, we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about. So if you enjoyed what you've heard from THC for free, consider signing up at thehiresidechatsplus.com to get the second hour of the five shows I put together each month. I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable, and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent, one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started with just a second hour for the main show, but now we've got a nice forum going where people can get deeper in conversation about the episodes with other listeners, submit a candidate in the guest request thread, or share their own personal projects to get out of the soul-crushing 9-to-5 cog-in-the-wheel life on the Entrepreneur's thread. The forum and the plus comments are always the first places I try to go for listener engagement, but it does get harder as the show gets more popular. Because of that, there's also a direct messaging feature that you can use to reach me through the plus site also. But beyond the form, if you like any of the music I've used for THC, most of it I've hired artists to make, and I provide it all as free downloads to Plus members too. So if you like a particular song you've heard close the show out recently, come get the MP3. I should also mention that if you don't like the idea of paying $5 recurring every month, I get that. You can buy three months, six months, or a year up front and just be done with it. I have plenty of listeners who send checks and money orders to the P.O. Box too, 
I try to make it as easy for people as I can, and you can read more about it on the sign-up page. Also, be sure to check out the FAQ help page on the Plus site if you have any questions or concerns about how to listen to a password-protected show on your devices. I've highlighted a lot of great solutions, and one of those would be the iPhone app that just recently hit the Apple App Store. A super kind and talented listener made it for us, and you can use it to stream or download either the free or the Plus show. If you're on Android, I'd use Pocket Casts or Podcast Addict and subscribe to the feed manually that way. I also try to throw in occasional bonus shows or Q&A shows, and I've got a few other weird ideas I might get to try out soon, but I give you all I can for five bucks, and I hope you'll at least give it a shot if you've listened to a few free shows and you find them unique or valuable. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, and I'm just one of them. But if you have any questions, concerns, or comments about any of this, please get in touch with us at the Higher Side Chats team at gmail.com. I also wanted to plug the Higher Side newsletter I'm going to be putting out totally free for anyone who wants to sign up at the main internet website for the show, thehiresidechats.com. You can also get on that email list through the Higher Side Chats Facebook page. There's a button there as well. But the reason I'm doing this is because I get tons and tons of emails after a show goes up asking me about how I feel about a particular guest or topic, and the wrap-up isn't always the best place to do that, especially if I have anything negative to say. Sometimes the dust needs to settle. Sometimes I need to hear feedback from you guys first. There are a lot of factors, but I usually have something to communicate to you, and I just don't get to do it. So on the first of the month, I plan to send out a little newsletter with my thoughts about the five shows the previous month, and talk to you about anything else that's on my mind or that's going on. And what's probably most enticing is that I'm going to give you some insight into at least one guest I have coming up in the month, which people have been begging for some posted schedule for a long time. I personally think I'd like the surprise. But sign up for the Higher Side newsletter. It's free. It comes out on the first of the month, and I won't waste your time with any other emails. And that's it. I appreciate you listening. I try to give alternative ideas and guests a fair shake on a high-quality podcast, expose some deep-level conspiracies without the yelling, and I hope to offer some inspiration that even though the system relentlessly suggests you should follow their blueprint to mediocrity, you can do your own thing and live a much happier life despite all the negativity in the world. So go ahead and treat yourself. Isn't it about time?